when you see me, you will notice that I am different. I was born different, and therefore I see the world differently. I do not have a right arm from the elbow down due to a congenital amputation. I have never seen myself as abnormal or disabled. I love the challenge of trying new things, and what most people find extreme or terrifying is on my list to try before I die. Here's a quote which sums me up quite well. Don't try and understand ordinary people when you are not one. The following documentary is a story of my single-handed adventure on the rapids of the Zambezi's Batoka Gorge. May it inspire you to be different and to make your dreams a reality. I started kayaking just before my son was born four years ago and I really just had the desire to kayak. I wanted to learn how to roll a kayak and that's kind of where it started. I knew that I needed to figure that out before I could kind of, you know, maybe take the, on the dream of doing the Zambezi. So I had to start off by figuring out how I was going to actually use a paddle on my arm. Was I going to use a prosthesis? Was I going to strap it on? I, I just had no clue really. Once I'd learned, once I'd actually successfully rolled, I thought, okay, well then, what else can there be to it? It must just be a matter of rolling whenever you need to and paddling when you're upright. And uh, little did I know that there was a whole lot more technical skills that needed to be learned. The cool thing about having one hand, whenever I have an um, idea to want to do something that's challenging, um, generally in the things that I've chosen to do, I'm the first to try. I asked around if anyone had ever heard of, of somebody doing Zambezi with one hand and nobody knows of anyone who's done it. The main goal in wanting to do the Zambezi was me doing what I had always dreamed to do. Being the first person to do it with one hand is an added bonus, a kind of a claim to fame, but it's not like many people will even really ever hear about that fact. That's not the goal for me. The goal is just that I had, a, had an idea, I had a passion to pursue something and managed to kind of put everything together in place to actually go and give it a go. In starting kayaking, my goal was to do the Zambezi one day. I didn't really know whether that was going to happen in 10 years time or happen in two years time and I didn't know that I'd ever really feel ready. There are really really big daunting rapids that I can't even find in my local area to practice on so it was more a matter of certain things falling into place for me to be able to go. And the main thing was is having a leader, a, a trip leader, a kayaker that I trusted that I knew that would be willing to take me down the river. So. Three years ago, um, in my first year of kayaking, I went to the Swazi Kayaking Festival in Swaziland and met a guy called Shane Raw. And Shane uh, has kayaked all over the world and is really well known in the South African kayaking community. This, I think, was Nick's first year of paddling. Obviously, it was amazing, incredible to see a guy that had only half of, of one arm and how he had kind of engineered this little loop to attach to the paddle and he was paddling you know, as well as most guys on the on the river, it was it was incredible to see, and that was a, a pretty inspirational for me. And that was the only time that I'd really paddled with him, up until this year when I saw on Facebook that Shane had posted saying that he is taking his son up to do the Zambezi, and that he's willing to take along any beginners or intermediate kayakers who are, have a bomb-proof role and have run a few rivers and can get themselves up there. Yeah, when Nick asked to join the trip. I was pretty stoked actually to be, to, to be able to help him um, in order to first of all realize that dream and also just to achieve something that as far as I'm aware anyway has never been done before. It's a great achievement for Nick and, and I'm really chuffed to actually be you know, part of it and helping him to make it happen. So over the past four years, I've followed lots of good kayakers down different rivers. And when I followed Shane, he understood where I was at and he understood my ability. So 
I started to think about ways of raising money and also and just really starting to kind of be honest with myself as an am I is my role good enough like can I kayak proficiently enough to even go to the Zambezi and have a decent time uh, when I mentioned the idea to my wife to my surprise she said well this sounds like a good opportunity and you have spoken fondly of Shane in the past and you know he's the kind of guy that you'd be happy going with maybe this is the time to do it so after about two weeks of my crowdfunding campaign being live it started to look like I was actually going to have enough money to go so in preparation for all of this coming together I had started training I started training when Shane kind of made that post on Facebook I thought well I've got to do my bit and at least be physically ready and then also start like really refining my role which was quite difficult being dry season in South Africa there wasn't lots of rivers to go and practice in I feel like the fact that people believe in me enough to give me money to go and I believe that I have a shot and my training all coming together and me actually feeling like I'm probably the fittest and strongest I've been in, in 10 years. Everything was just falling into place. It's exciting to travel anywhere. Um, I haven't been back to the Zambezi for 10 years. You know, I haven't ever gone on a trip with a kayak on a plane. So like it's all new and it's all exciting. And, and then we're gonna have to somehow get our kayaks onto a, a plane, which, which apparently doesn't always go, go so smoothly. We have to kind of convince the airline that they surf boards. And you know, there was talk about packing your, bag, your kayak up into like a big bag and riding surfboard on it. And so I haven't done that. Shane says that we should be fine with just kayaks and paddles, but who knows how it's all gonna go. So the Batoka Gorge is basically the gorge that feeds off the bottom end of the Victoria Falls and so it's a pretty intimidating place. The cliffs that are on either side are kind of 150 to 200 meters. The river itself is a mass of water that's getting funneled down a very narrow gorge. And so immediately when you look at the Zambezi River, you kind of think that doesn't look safe and it doesn't look slow either. The speed of the water, the rapid sections from aerial view or from aerial footage that I've seen, it's just like a big white mess for a pretty big chunk of the gorge, you know, so. Zambezi has a pretty fearsome reputation and it is certainly known as one of the, the bigger and more difficult rivers in this part of the world, for sure. It's also an iconic river because very few places in the world do you get this volume of water. It's, you know, it's warm temperatures, the water's a great temperature. It's massive, big, fluffy, white water, but still relatively friendly. If you know where you're going, you can stay away from the dangerous parts. And you have to have a solid roll. If you don't know how to Eskimo roll properly, you're gonna do a lot of swimming, and you're not really gonna have a good time. The gorge is so steep on both sides that there are these little makeshift wooden ladders that you have to climb up and climb down. It's intimidating. Just the walk in, you think, if I slip here, I'm going to seriously injure myself. And that's before you even get uh, near the river. And on river level, normally in a, in, a, in a river which I've kayaked lots, the eddies are nice and calm. There's an eddy where you can see like that's clearly the calm water next to the main flow. But in the Zambezi, the eddies look like whirlpools. There's just constant movement everywhere. And that's pretty intimidating and overwhelming. Leading up to the trip, I had heard about previous kayaking trips to the Zambezi and how they kind of ease themselves in and that you can't take on the whole river in, in a day, first time, you know, never done it before. And so my expectation was that we would do something like that. But I was also apprehensive in, in, in asking Shane because he has offered his services kind of he'd offered to lead this trip 
um, but we're not paying him anything for it and so I didn't want to then like um, be like okay so, so Shane how, how are you what, what are you going to do to adapt the trip so that I can have a nice intro to the Zambezi because the other guys here are all just keen to kayak anything me and Gideon have been a little bit apprehensive about just kayaking everything especially first day and so we literally just didn't talk about it we didn't talk about what was going to happen until like 10 o'clock that night Shane said okay so so who's coming to number one tomorrow with me and I was like <laughs> Does that mean we just do like number one or what? Like, does that mean we're gonna do number two, three, four or like? And he's like, no, we'll put on a one and then we can take out a 21. <laughs> and I thought this is not what I expected at all. I wanted some easing in, you know? So and I said, so is that the only option? And he was like, well, you could, potentially you could put in a 10 and you could take out a 21. So then that still means doing 11 rapids on the first day. And in those 11 rapids at the bottom, there's still the Mother and the Terminators and Oblivion and they're all class 5 rapids. I know, I've researched this, I know what they're like. So we had to just kind of come to some sort of agreement and I, and I agreed that I didn't want to start the trip with part of the group missing. So I wasn't going to do the half day thing. So if Shane's going to number one, I'm going to number one. And I really like, I'm not happy about the idea of going to number one because that still means doing the big chunky rapids of the top section on day one. So I, yeah, I could, I could take out a 10, but I've got to get to 10. And I don't know how I feel about getting all the way to 10 on the first day. So walking down into the gorge, I don't know, I was pretty upbeat. Most of the nerves had kind of stopped because I was like, well, this is it. I'm here, I'm, I'm gonna get in my boat and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it. We'll just have to take whatever comes. The river was getting louder and louder as we were going down and there's a tributary that's flowing down next to you as you're walking down. So we just got down to the, the boiling pot. There it is. There's the bridge, Zambia Zim bridge. And uh, first time I've seen the rapids and they look exciting and uh, not too big, which is good. It's like sensory overload and excitement overload and nerve overload all together. And so I kind of felt exhausted by the time I got into my boat. <laughs> And then like, getting into my boat and looking at what was in front of me, we were putting into an eddy and I knew that the first kind of, and one of the more difficult moves of the day really would be getting across, ferrying across the bottom of rapid number one. So the, the eddy that you put into is just below rapid number one. Uh, you have to ferry across number one because number one, the name of the rapid is called against the wall. So all of the water is flushing against this big wall and you don't really want to get pushed against the wall because rolling up there can be pretty horrible and just a really horrible way to start the day so it was really overwhelming i just thought i have to do what i gotta do so um, push boats off the rock into the eddy and um yes i was really taken taken back by how when walking down to number one i could see lots of white water and waves um and i was like that looks cool that, that looks fun like it's a wave train you know <laughs> and then i put my boat into the eddy and i look over at number one and like those waves that i saw were now like over my head in terms of height and the water was moving really really fast guy i've only ever maybe been on water that fast once before and so yeah i felt very much out of my depth and uh, i was very unsure as to how this this ferry was going to go and then if the ferry didn't go then go well i can't swim rapid number one on the same easy on day one and i can't get out yet either because like i got to get to number 10 at least to get out straight away I rolled up straight away which was a good confidence booster um, and then actually made it across and um, was kind of feeling like uh, this is happening like I looked up and saw the bridge uh, with the bungee rope hanging there and like I'd always 10 years ago I looked down at that river from the bungee bridge when I did the bungee and thought flip like um, you know I want to be down there in a kayak so it was cool to actually yeah to, to be there and take it all in but in the back of my mind, I'm just thinking number four is coming, number five is coming. <laughs> what am I going to do? And we kind of had spoken about a plan about maybe trying number four because it's a class walk. It's quite big. And, uh, and, then, and then I'd definitely walk number five because number five is really big. You don't do that on the first day like that silly. And then 
In going into number two and three, number two and three are really kind of uh, surfing waves. So I thought, well, <laughs> there's no way I'm surfing anything here. I'm just gonna like punch through these waves and hopefully be okay. And I, I, was, I was feeling very wet and waterlogged, like a full day of kayaking had already happened. And I was only at number two going into number three. So approaching number four, Shane gave me a quick kind of, this is what we're gonna do. And the way to do number four, easier line on number four is to catch the eddy. And then after the eddy, then you kind of ferry out across to river, river left and then, and then punch two big holes. Well, maybe, yeah, it's one big hole and one small. They were both huge as far as I was concerned. So I start paddling behind Shane to try and catch the eddy. I start thinking to myself, I'm not even gonna catch the eddy. I'm gonna land up just going on my own down the rapids. So I managed to just make the eddy and like smash into a rock and almost go over in the eddy. And I was, I was just thinking, this is all too much. What have I done here? <laughs> From the eddy, Shane gave me a little kind of briefing as to what to expect. This was a rapid that they were quite concerned about because there's like a big cushion wave along the wall all the way down and you kind of you can get kind of stuck in the busyness of this cushion wave so you want to really stay far away from it but all the water is forcing you into the right so you kind of have to ferry it across um, and keep pushing left the whole way through and so it just sounded like very technical so I was like well you know all I'm going to do is, is follow Shane and try and do what he does and keep my edge up and not go over you know and so I'm used to keeping my edge up on the vol, you know, where you can kind of like lift the, your knee slightly and your edge is up. But the moment I got into the fast moving water, my um, upriver edge wasn't high enough and it just flipped me over. And so I'd been practicing rolling and I knew that in this kind of water, I couldn't roll well. And I knew that on the Zambezi, you have to wait a little bit longer to actually roll successfully. Nick got knocked over by one of the waves coming off the right hand wall and went upside down into the big hole at the bottom and then was in a situation where he had to roll. This is now his first attempt at a, at a, pro, at a roll in really, really turbulent water. Um, and it's quite a long wave train that leads out from rapid number four. And um, I think, I, I, I forget how many attempts there, but after sort of four or five attempts, he was still in the, in, you know, in the grips of the current and um, came out the boat and that was the sort of first swim of the whole Zambezi experience um, which yeah, I guess came very early on and I, I think was a, a bit of a concern for Nick at that stage. Swimming is just the worst idea because it was so difficult to make progress there because you've got a splash deck that's catching water and you, I've still got my paddle strapped to my arm. I was doing my best to kind of get to the side so that they didn't have to worry about me and they could you know, just catch my boat or something but it just didn't go well and I was feeling very, very disappointed about the first big rapid of the day and me swimming it because I actually hadn't swum in a while in, in any river so this is damaging my pride and um, just the first start of the day. And I kept thinking to myself, you know Shane, we could have started at number 10. <laughs> you know, and I could have eased into this, but here I am on the first day trying one of the really big rappers of the river. Got back into my boat, Shane asked how I was feeling and I, and I was like pretty disappointed. This isn't the way I wanted to do this. I'm definitely walking number five. So he's like, okay, you know, number five is just one big drop and then it's all over. You just got to roll up and you'll be fine. Then the other local Zambian kayaker that was with us, he said, no, you really don't want to walk number five. The walk is horrible. <laughs> so I think, well, you know, maybe, maybe the rapid will be horrible as well, like if I go into it. So I kind of spoke to Gideon, who was also planning on walking number five. And I said to him, you know, what do you think? And he's like, well, I made it through number four, so I'm feeling like maybe I'm gonna do number five. So I was like, okay, fine, I'll just do it. What's the worst that can happen? I'll swim the first two rapids, the first two big rapids. Five is one of the most difficult um, commercially rafted rapids in the world. Um, so it's not to be messed around with. So I've got these thoughts in my mind and I've also got Shane saying, it's just one big drop and the local guy saying, so it's a difficult walk. Okay, my kayak is gonna tire me out as well. Maybe I'll just be better off in my kayak and just roll. Um, so I remember so clearly coming into number five and thinking like, flip, <laughs> this is huge. And basically just bracing and, and preparing to roll, you know? Um, and I got thrown over the moment I hit the first lateral. I ro actually rolled up fairly quickly and then got hit by another big wave. 
and then rolled up again and I was up and I was out of the worst stuff and I just remember shouting. And then I turn around and look, Kideon swimming. <laughs> so I was, I was, I was thinking, flip man, like he's a better kayaker than me and now, and now he's swimming. And like, I just made it through this. So yeah, it was really, it was such a great feeling to have actually done one big rapid. And if, if I could have gone back to the backpackers then at that point, I, I would have been happy because, you know, I would have succeeded at doing a class five. So after my successful run on number five, I knew that I had only really one rapid that I had to walk, which was number seven. And the rest I could try and run, sorry, number seven and number nine. So number nine is commercial suicide. I was never planning on kayaking that. I will never kayak that. I'm just, um, I didn't start kayaking when I was five. So I don't think I'll ever be good enough. So, so number nine was always a given that I would walk. But also number seven is a, is a very long rapid. And so swimming number seven would be a very horrible swim and potentially dangerous. So we had discussed already at the beginning of day one that I would walk number seven. Number eight has two lines on it. One's a very center meaty line where there's like a big crashing hole. And then the right hand line doesn't have the big crashing hole. And so I followed Shane down that line. Being the easier line, Shane hadn't run that line in like 20 years. So he also didn't necessarily know what it was like and what to expect. And it turns out there was some quite technical moves to pull, like to avoid some smaller holes. And it was just like all too big for me. So I went over quite early. Um, tried to roll. Again, Nick, again, come on. Come on, buddy. Ah. Oh, man. All right. Didn't roll, then landed up swimming again. By this point, swimming four and swimming eight, and just like lots of big water kayaking, I was pretty tired. Pulling into the eddy at number nine to do the portage, my forearm cramped so badly that I couldn't lift my fingers. I had to like physically push my fingers back because my forearm was just completely cramped. And it could have been that I'd been overworking my left arm, kind of using my confidence side more or whatever. But so I was feeling pretty down about things and there was only one more rapid of the day. And in all the research I'd done, the description of number 10 was an easy wave train before lunch. And so we were, I'd then decided to take out at, at number 10 and uh, it was considered a good kind of first attempt at the Zambezi. So I just had to do the easy wave train before lunch, which I landed up swimming as well. At the end of day one, I said to myself, you know what, if I never do the top 10 rappers of the Zambezi again, I think I'll be happy enough. Because I can say that I, that I tried it and it was too much. So I was depressed about how bad my rolling was and the fact that I had to swim. It took lots of kind of like self-talk and convincing to kind of be happy and ready for day two. But I was very sure at the end of day one that if I never did the top section again, I'd be okay with that. So I was then kind of then focusing myself on, okay, I'm gonna do the bottom 11 rapids. Let's see what the bottom was like. Problem with that is that number 11 is a really dangerous rapid for a swim. So you really have to have be on top of your game to do number 11. So I thought, okay, that's fine. I'll walk number 11 and then I'll get in and then just do 12. And I've heard really nice things about that bottom section in terms of what it was like. So I was confident going into 11 actually has 11 uh, B and C and then 12 A, B and C. And then 13 is the mother, which is the first real big, you know, um, whole wave, horrible white mess. <laughs> And then, you know, so I, 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 was, I was more r relaxed and so that kind of was paying off. My boat control was a bit better and so on. Um, I made it through the 11s, but it's, it's very continuous. The 11s and the 12s are very continuous. And so I didn't feel like swimming here would be a good idea. I was still very much getting used to how busy the water was outside of the rapids. The Zambezi flows so fast that the eddies the eddy lines, the boils and the currents that are just constantly there are always pulling at your boat. And so because my playboat has some significant edges, I was having to fight stuff the whole time. So I would get through something big and then I'd be caught out by something small. And so there was this constant fighting and I wasn't necessarily ready for continuous kind of all the way through 11 and all the way 12 fighting. And so after 12B, I got thrown by a boil. There's a really big boil coming off the wall on the right and went over, tried to roll, tried to roll, tried to roll and just 
just couldn't get up. Like I just felt like my paddle was slicing through air, you know, like I wasn't able to just push up on anything. So I swam, but I, in swimming, I knew that it was a really bad idea because swimming is always <laughs> a bad idea, but um, because the you know, 12C and 13 were coming up and they come up quite quickly. The moment I surfaced from kind of coming out of my boat, there was a raft there and the raft was coming over to me quite quickly. So I thought, well, they probably want me in the raft because they don't, swimming through 13 is a bad idea, you know? And on the raft, which is fairly high off the water, as we went into 13, I thought, I'm so glad I didn't swim through this because this looks really, really big. I was very disappointed with myself for having swum, for being on a raft. I was just like <laughs> miffed with the world. My boat, they eventually caught my boat after 13. They brought the kayak over to the raft and I, I said to the raft guy, I said, can you just put my kayak in the raft? Because I don't think I'm going to do 15. I don't think I'm going to do 18. Because I knew 15, 17 and 18 were big rapids and required some very specific moves. And I couldn't even make it past the boil on number 12. So I was very much disappointed with what was happening and so I just sat on the raft moping about. Shane came over and I chatted to Shane and I said look perhaps I should just sit here until after 18 and I'll paddle 19 to 21 because they're smaller and easier. I guess the the lower section although it's regarded as the sort of slightly easier section it still has a couple of really big rapids and to be honest, some of the most sort of boily areas of the river, even the small rapids, you know, you come through and the, the, the current hits the wall of the river and it turns over on itself and creates these real, real sort of powerful boils that kind of come out of nowhere and just swallow your boat completely. And those can get really difficult to keep yourself upright in for the best of kayakers. I mean, it happens to the best in the world. They'll get swallowed in a, up in a boil like that without any notice. The fact that the Nick was struggling in those boils on the second day, we then had to kind of go back to the drawing board and rethink the boat situation. So, so the realization really started to hit me that perhaps I've taken the wrong boat. Prior to our trip, I chatted to, to Shane quite extensively about boat choice. I was concerned that I was perhaps in a shorter boat that wasn't going to serve me well. But it was the boat that I was most familiar with and most comfortable with. And on the rivers that I'd been training, my playboat was fine. And I could roll it really easily on those rivers and in flat water I could roll it easily. But on the Zambezi, I was just on a hiding to none. I just really just wasn't in the right boat. And so in that time that I sat on the raft moping, I came to the realization that actually, if there is a bigger boat around, I think I must try it because I need as much in my favor as I can have in my favor to get the Zambezi done in an enjoyable way. Luckily, one of the local operators had a, had a kayak that we could hire, which was slightly larger and it's sort of a, a regarded as a creek boat. Um, a little bit longer, a little bit more volume, a little bit more stable. And yeah, that proved to be the, the, the trick, that proved to be the medicine because we got in back up at the top on day three with a new boat, it's a much longer boat, it's a much heavier boat. The moment I was in the eddy, it was a whole lot more unstable and I really didn't like feel so confident. At this point, I would tried a new paddle, I'd broken my nose plug, I had a raw arm from my paddle, like chafing my arm all day long. The odds were completely against me. I didn't really feel good about what had happened up till now. The first two days had really been unsuccessful. I could say that I tried rapid one to 12 because I sat on the raft for the rest really. So I couldn't say anything. I actually sat at the end of day two thinking I can't even say I've done one to 21 because I hadn't. And I couldn't even say that I'd done one to 10 because I hadn't because I'd swum three of them. So I knew that I kind of had to start day three with a, with a new perspective, a fresh start, new boat. Still no nose plugs. And it may seem like a small thing to somebody who's never kayaked not having nose plugs. It's like a nasal enema every single time you go over. You can do what you want, the water just goes straight up and it really throws you off, uh, disorientates you even more when you're over. And I now have to do the very tricky start of fairing across number one. Anyways, it actually went really well. It went really well and I made it through and then I practiced a roll on rapid number two, rolled up first time and I thought, you know what, 
this isn't so bad. I knew what was coming at number four and I was quite apprehensive about number four because this being now the first wrap that I had to kind of redeem myself on. And also it's a, it's a technical move to catch the eddy, um, still learning out, figuring this new boat, catching an eddy in a longer boat, a bit different. So there's lots of things going through my mind. Caught the eddy, try to follow Shane again. Actually managed to follow him fairly like long. I was like, wow, I'm still up, I'm still up, I'm still going. <laughs> and then uh, got thrown over in the hole at the bottom and rolled up, it was really, really chuffed that I was still in my boat. I'd done the first big rapid of the day. The new boats like obviously helped me a little bit because I managed to stay upright for longer. You know, coming in into number five, I thought, well, everyone's been going on the right hand line on the pour over. By the sounds of it, it's not very technical in terms of what you have to do when you get to the pour over. You just kind of hang on once again and roll up at the bottom. The more technical side of things is getting to the pour over because the water's all forcing left, which is the main route, which is center and left. So I knew more or less what to do. So I really tried my best to kind of get that pour over line. got thrown over very quickly, rolled several times, but finished in my boat. It was turning out to be a successful day. I'd done the two big rapids, or the first two big rapids of the day in my boat. And so the boat was definitely paying off. And what I started to realize from then, then on is that I wasn't fighting so much in the quieter stuff. The boils weren't throwing me off. I was able to pick up speed easier and actually like hoof over some things and punch through some things. Even in number six, number six, my, the, the, the long creek boat got back looped in number six, which like really caught me off guard, but I managed to roll it back up easier. It was a really good feeling to be kind of succeeding at this. The plan was always, always still to walk number seven. I was not convinced that running seven from all the stories I'd heard and the stuff that I'd seen in the footage that they had shot so far that number seven was a good option for me to run ever um, on the trip this trip or ever, you know, because it's just a really long rapid and it's very complex. This time in trying to take out at number seven, it was just me and Gideon and the Zambian guy that was with us previously who showed us where the takeout was, wasn't with us. So we'd only have done this once before. Uh, number seven is a really wide rapid and there are actually channels to run on the left. So you kind of have to skirt those channels and then make it to a, a place where you can take out. But once again, the Zambezi water is moving really fast. Um, so Shane and the rest of the team headed down the main line on the right. Me and Gideon were going for the takeout. And Gideon said to me right before we kind of started going, he said, just don't go near that messy boil stuff right near the end. And before I knew it, I was like on top of the messy boil stuff. And Gideon was like taking his boat out. So he hadn't really kind of checked to see where I was yet. And other guys are long gone and I was on the messy boil stuff and I now spun my boat around and I was facing upstream and I looked over my left hand shoulder and there was a monster hole and the water was really forcing me that way and I had to really like talk to myself and convince myself that I can paddle out of this because I knew that if I stuffed that up there um, I'm going to swim into a horrible well, I'm going to go into a horrible hole and I may and I may end up swimming or I may end up getting you know like it was just like I there was a moment where I really realized like I can't mess this up and luckily didn't mess it up and made it to the takeout. But that experience of trying to take my boat out at number seven was like really just quite overwhelming. And then on top of that, this new boat, my spray deck, when each time I tried to put my spray deck on, it kept on popping off at the back, which like in my playboat never happens and my creeker never happens. and. You know, in having kayaked for four years, I should be able to put a spray deck on on my own. Like that should be something you achieve and are able to do. 
Obviously the history of having one hand, I don't like being dependent on, on other people. I don't want to have to be like, hey, can you help me put my spray deck on, you know, on the Zambezi. I should be competent enough to do that, but I knew that in having to carry my boat on this portage, I was gonna need help from Kideon to put my spray deck on when I got back in. And there was this like uneasiness and I have to rely on him to help me back into my boat. And so like I was just getting hot full altogether with the situation. I couldn't just have fun at number seven. The rest of the, the team were already at the bottom of number seven and a half waiting for us. And I came down seven and a half and I actually didn't know there was seven and a half. I thought there was eight. And I came out of that and I was just tired from the portage and the spray deck thing and like almost dying at the top of number seven. And said to Shane, please tell me that was number eight, you know, that I just come through. And he's like, no, that was seven and a half. Um, and I thought, flip, I just got to make it to 10 today and I'm going to take out. I'm not doing it to anyone. If I can stay in my boat and not swim till 10, that would be a massive success. I need to just you know, get through eight, portage nine, get through 10, don't swim 10, and you know, then go home because it'll be a success. Number eight, I still followed Shane through on the right hand line. I knew what to expect this time. I went through eight without rolling on the right hand line, which was amazing because eight is like a fairly complex line and big and so I thought flip like maybe I'm actually getting better at this like maybe I'm actually making progress so that was a really really good feeling and I, I knew what I got to do now was make the eddy on number nine portage number nine and one big wave train before lunch no swimming in number 10 and I'll, I'll, I'll I can go home I, I could go home from the Zambezi <laughs> and say that I did number one to ten no swims which was a real big achievement so no, nicely done. Or one to ten, no swim. That's awesome. That's a big achievement. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think straight away Nick realised that the boat made a huge difference. Just being a lot more stable in the in the boily stuff, and he was able to kind of just relax more between between the rapids and even in the smaller stuff because in that tiny little playboat you have to be on your guard all the time and you're constantly fighting boils and fighting uh, you know, whirlpools and things like that whereas the bigger boat kind of carved its way through all of that stuff and generally made it a little more uh, comfy a little bit more easy to deal with. So no swims at all on day three which was great on the on the upper half. So. On day four in doing the bottom section in my kayak, I had a whole lot of demons to overcome because I had to, you know, first do all of those for once in my kayak. And I hadn't, I'd only seen them from a raft and they would look very intimidating. And I knew that these big boils were coming on 12B. So I was very like prepared and I did go over and it took a while to roll up. And when I rolled up, Shane was behind me and um, Shane said to me, um, And I was like, you're meant to be leading me down here. Like, I know how big the mother is and yeah, now you're sending me ahead of you to go into it. So I really like, it was one of those moments where I just put my head down and just paddled hard and thought, well, wh whatever comes, comes. And I actually did punch through the mother and I got thrown over by a small wave afterwards, but rolled up and stayed in my boat and yeah, I was really feeling like I'm, I'm kind of on a, on a roll here. I'm, I'm staying in my boat, which is a great start. I'm, I'm learning stuff. Um, the boils didn't throw me over. So the, the, the rest of that bottom section actually wasn't as intimidating as I expected it to be. I had a close call at number 17. I was worried about 15, 17 and 18 because they all involve avoiding holes, very big holes in the middle of the river. So all the water is forcing you there and you've got to kind of get away from them. And in my effort to get away from the hole um, on number 17, you're gonna break a big lateral wave and I broke the lateral wave and was fine and then the eddy, the eddy line just threw me over. And then I was then forced back into the mainstream and so I tried to roll but I was rolling into moving water, it wasn't going so well and I rolled up and Shane was coming straight for me. I don't know what he was, I think he was planning on knocking my boat past the hole because it's a really big horrible hole and um, I rolled up, was facing upstream, looked over my left shoulder and I saw this massive hole that I was you know, half a meter away from. So it felt good to you know, obviously end that rapid in my boat and not have any incidents, but it was a close call. And literally as I rolled up and pulled it back into the eddy, everyone was like, flip Nick, why did you take so long to get up on this particular spot, you know? 
So yeah, then I managed to go skirt around the big hole um, of Oblivion, number 18. And then yeah, I had a really good paddle down to the bottom. So I could now say that I had to run an average of one to 21 successfully, stayed in my boat, no swims, but I had walked seven and I'd walked nine and I'd walked 11. And I was always planning on walking nine, but seven and 11 were now starting to become, you know, maybe perhaps, perhaps I can try those ones, you know? Uh, and then also the next big objective is to do one to 21 in a day. And by this point, I'd been kayaking for four days and was getting pretty tired. By day five, Nick was feeling confident and that was actually the, the, the first day that we did a, a run of the entire river, right from rapid one to 21. He ran rapid seven, like a pro. <laughs> he uh, had, a, had a small uh, lapse of concentration at the top of the rapid seven and actually rolled before we got into the main part of the rapid. But then, you know, corrected that, got himself upright again and then actually had a really good line through the rest of the rapid, through the main part of the rapid, which was fantastic. got down to rapid 11 as well which he had not um, run up until that stage mainly because there's some really really nasty boils on the left hand side just after the main the entry to the rapid and that's a place you definitely don't want to find yourself upside down or even worse out of your boat but again he sliced through the V wave entering the rapid and made it through without any problem and had a clear run all the way through to, to 21 on that day, which basically meant that other than rapid number nine, which is regarded as commercial suicide, that means Nick had actually done a, a complete run of the river from the top to the bottom and, and successfully run each rapid as well. And that brings us to where we are right now. Tomorrow is our last day on the river. We're gonna do another complete run from the top to the bottom. We're gonna make the most of it, absolutely. So day seven, the last day is always a big day and so you know I was going to try and do what I'd done on day five and just do it again so that I'd done the full river you know twice all the rapids no swims and I was, I was actually looking forward to doing number seven again I was really keen on number seven and I wanted to run the center line on number eight again because I'd now on day five ran center line on number eight which is a really big crashing hole so yeah I'd done all the kind of different lines that I wanted to do Besides the pour over on number five. I still hadn't made it to the pour over. I really wanted a photo of me doing the pour over. I really wanted to just achieve that for myself and not take the line that, that kind of everyone takes as a, as, a, as a beginner on the river. And so this time Shane decided to go behind me and shout directions in terms of where I should go and when I should go. Cause my previous two attempts I'd been too far left. So I decided to go really far right and I went through the indicator wave fine and Shane was shouting to me to kind of straighten up but I didn't hear him and I saw there was a significant hole coming before the pour over. I could see the pour over and I was about five meters from the pour over and there's quite a big hole. So I did my best to kind of punch through the hole. Start going right. Straighten up. Oh shit. And all of a sudden I just got, felt like I was going backwards. I got sucked back into the hole and flipped over. I now knew that like, this was like a really bad idea because being upside down going over the pour over was, would be pretty catastrophic. And so I, I rolled in the hole and I saw I was still in the hole and I was like, I didn't think this hole was this big, but I'm still in the hole and I've rolled twice. 
and then I got flushed out of the hole and I rolled up and I mean five meters is not a large space when the water's moving that quickly and I rolled up and I saw the pour over but I was like next to the pour over on the really rocky side of the pour over. So I went upside down pretty much as I went over the pour over I went upside down and I don't remember much. I The next thing I remember is trying to breathe in water like I like, tried to breathe realized I was underwater opened my eyes and like I could see my spray deck like because the water's fairly clear I could see my, my, my spray deck and I was still being tossed around a bit I, I was like oh, I got to get out my boat um, my paddle like I, I actually couldn't feel my paddle I don't know what it what, you know what was wrong but like my, my paddle was, was there but not really there but I was really out of it and my head hurt like really 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 badly I managed to like realize well if I don't pull now like I'm stuck under the water so I found my spray deck pulled it came up and I think I was just shouting help or shouting just shouting um, because like I knew I was in trouble or something had happened I don't know what had happened and I, re I remember just moaning and groaning and just being barely able to hold on to the boat as they dragged me to the side and then got to the side and took my helmet off and the first thing I said to Shane was like my eardrum's blown, like I can't hear anything on this side. You know? Okay, yeah, you've got a bit of a bang on the ear there. Tiny bit of blood, not much. And then I looked down at my paddle and I only had half a paddle. <laughs> I had a split paddle, so I thought, well, it just unsplit as I was going over. So I thought, oh, well, you know, that's lost. So while I'm like kind of feeling my head and trying to figure out exactly what's going on, Shane's asking me questions and I mean, I knew what had happened, so I wasn't wasn't so out of it that I didn't know where I was or anything. I knew what had happened. I knew um, that I tried to do the pour over and missed it. I knew it was the last day of the trip and so on, but my head really hurt. Immediately the whole back side of my ear was swollen, my ear was bleeding and I couldn't hear out of it. And then I had a hole in my vest and my, and my shoulder was pretty sore. So the whole left side of my body had basically taken a big hit. Just like a few minutes later, they bought my, the pieces of my paddle. They picked up the pieces, the paddle had broken and had a really severe headache. So we kind of had to carry on going because, you know, we kind of stick with the rafts and then we get transport out with the rafts. And so I decided to sit in a raft and then uh, Shane was going to tow my, my boat down the river because it was too big to now put in the raft. Yeah, so then Dane Jackson um, came over and said, look, like, if, you, if you still want to paddle, it's fine, I'll use your half and you can use my paddle and you can carry on going, you know, and I was like, oh, thanks, but my head hurts really badly. <laughs> And I really wanted to do seven and I really wanted to do eight and I knew that like this is my opportunity. If I want to do seven and eight, I've got to get back in my boat now. But I, my, my head was too sore. And so sat in the raft till number nine, portage number nine, carried my boat and was actually feeling okay, you know. Besides the fact that like I couldn't hear, my ear and head was swollen. There was nothing else wrong. My shoulder felt fine enough to go. So I decided to take Dane up on his offer of paddle. I did the seal launch off into the water after number nine and yeah, I felt I, I had a headache but I was okay. <laughs> and so paddle number 10 uh, rolled like three times in number 10 but the new paddle actually rolled up, rolled up fine um, but every time I went over my ear felt really bad like I, I could feel like water going all the way in and all the way out and it was sore and when I like pinched my nose and blew to like equalize I just heard bubbles and I felt this warm like stuff dripping down my neck and it was yeah, so clearly my ear was in a, in a bit of a state. So got to 10 and Shane said, okay, cool. Well, Nick, you know, you've, you've at least given it a go. I think you must go home now, you know, and walk out at number 10. And then I was like, no, man, like, I just paddled number 10. If, if I can paddle 10, 
I can paddle 11 to 21. Like, I know it's there, I know I can do it. Um, yeah, paddled all the way to the end and they got out at 21 and finished it on a, on a, on a good note, being in my kayak, although I was in a, a lot of pain. Dude, Thanks, man. well done, man. I'm like, I'm super stoked for you. I'm sorry about the freaking last day. That was... Yeah, that was a definite little reminder that the river is still something to be treated with respect, eh? Yeah, and there... This is what's left of my paddle. Well, no, there is more. Somebody else has it. Um, something interesting happened at number five. I banged my head, broke my paddle, banged my shoulder. Can't hear out of this ear. <laughs> There's water in there somewhere. Um, but I'm glad I did it, and uh, it is now finished <laughs> for now. So, um, yeah, all done. Bottom section today, nice swim, so I'm, I'm chuffed. Just in a bit of pain. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Nick. So um, we were just we just thought we'd uh, add a little note here. Um, that ding that you took to the brain today, <laughs> to the melon, that was one hell of a blow. And you came up talking gibberish, and um, took a little while to clear things up. But one thing is for sure: to get back in your boat and to carry on paddling the rest of the day after that, that takes some serious balls, dude, and cool, yeah. and courage. So, well done. Well done. That dude. was really, really, really impressive. Very respectful. You are one serious dude. So, one great to have ass. you. Great to have you on the trip and honored to paddle with you. Same here. And, um, yeah, good one. Away. Away. I was quite concerned about my ear that night and uh, had a look at the footage and realized actually like how long I was underwater for and like how bad it was and that day I didn't wear a GoPro on my helmet. I kind of wanted one day where I was just not worried about footage and stuff. So I couldn't get my perspective but got everyone else's perspective and some photos and yeah it, it looked like pretty horrible what had happened and I literally couldn't hear and I was in a lot of pain and so I knew flying home the next day might be complicated with pressure changes and stuff but Got home, didn't see a doctor, because I thought, well, if it's an eardrum, everyone was telling me an eardrum healed fairly quickly, you know? So I didn't see a doctor for like three or four days, and I was feeling fine besides the lack of hearing and the pain. But I've been on painkillers for like now, now three or four days, so I thought I'd better go to the doctor, and uh, she immediately referred me to an ENT. My ear had still been leaking a lot of fluid, and um, he was concerned that that fluid was um, cerebral fluid, CFS. Um, and that I'd actually fractured my skull. So he wanted to do a CT scan and confirm that there was a fracture and the leaking stopped like 10 days later and the pain stopped like 10 days later and my eardrum was just badly ruptured. Was it worth rupturing my eardrum to do the Zambezi? Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, I didn't like, the crazy part is, right, is that the group I was kayaking with, everyone was boof the pour over, boof the pour over, boof the pour over on number five, you know? So I was like, I thought that was what was done, you know? There was a British group of kayakers on the river at the same time of us. None of them touched the pour over. None of them even contemplated touching the pour over. They all said, no, it's a stupid idea. It's too dangerous, like, and they were good kayakers. They were really competent. They were running seven fine. They were running the whole river without swimming. So like the group I was with, it was very much a thing to do. Maybe the British guys were too cautious. The British guys never ran 11 because of the fact that the swim there is so dangerous. So, you, you know, am I glad that I was with a non-cautious group of kayakers? Yeah, because like I was able to push myself and actually try a specific line on a rapid and not just, you know, do what everyone else does. So it was definitely worth trying. You know, I think that if my training hadn't been what it was, I would have broken my collarbone. Or if it, the hit had been on my right hand side, I probably would have broken my collarbone. Because to take that much force on your left, um, or on your shoulder from that direction, it would generally break your collarbone. And, and that would have been a way worse scenario. I would not want to sit in a raft with a broken collarbone till 10. But yeah, I'm thankful that it turned out the way it was. My helmet uh, did protect my head. I'm glad I had a good helmet. I think it would have been way worse if I had a, had a, a a poorer quality helmet. I would 
I'd probably try and do the four over again. Give an opportunity. Like when people ask me now, how was the Zambezi? Like did it go as you had planned? And I was like, really, literally, it sounds cheesy, but it was a dream come true. I achieved what I set out to do. I've achieved what I dreamed to do. It's such a destination that before it gets dammed up, I'd like to go back and just live the dream, you know, because kayaking the Zambezi is an amazing dreamlike experience. <laughs>